To this day, the Mothman is a significant part of West Virginian folklore. On November 15, 1966, in Point Pleasant, two couples, Roger and Linda Scarberry and Steve and Mary Mallet, went to the police claiming they saw a large grey winged creature with eyes that glowed red. These eyewitness testimonies appear courtesy of the Mothman Museum in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, which is the world's only Mothman museum and shop. Roger Scarberry's Report Tuesday night, about 12 o'clock, while we were riding in the TNT area, we came upon this thing. It was in the shape of a man with wings. This thing stood about six feet tall with wings on its back. It was light grey in colour, with red eyes about two inches in diameter, six to eight inches apart. When we came up over a rise in the road in front of the powerhouse, Steve saw these large red eyes. He pointed the eyes out to me, and when we all looked, it was going around the corner of the building. This thing runs awkward, with its wings out to its side. We all stopped and looked at each other. I took off out the road toward the highway. When we came to the traffic circle and turned south on 62, we saw it again. It was on the bank on the left side of the road. This is where you could see it the best. But when the car lights were shown on it, it moved its wings out to its side and went straight up in the air. We didn't see it again till we were all on the straight road in front of the experiment farm where it came over the car again. I speeded up to a hundred miles per hour and it glided over the car till we came to the curve at the armory. Then it was gone. We came on into town. This thing must have been afraid of the lights because it wouldn't come into town. We went downtown and stopped. We wanted to tell the police, but we were going back up to see for sure that it was still up the road. But when we were going up through town, we decided we didn't want to go back up. So I turned around at the gate at C.C. Lewis's farm. When I turned around, a dead dog was lying in the road. As I turned and started back down the road, this thing came out from behind where the dog was and went over the back of the car and out through the field on the other side of the road. Then we went down to Tiny's driving and told Gary what we saw and told him to call the police. When the police got there, Gary and the police followed us back up the road where we saw it again. The dog was gone. But when his car came over the hill behind us, it was gone. From there, we went back to this field but didn't see it again. So, we went down to town. Then we went with the deputy sheriff back to the power plant and stopped. We sat in the car and saw dust or smoke coming up from the coal yard beside the plant. From there, we went back and got in the car and went home. The next day, we went back to the power plant and looked around, where Steve saw it again in a boiler inside the plant. Then, Wednesday night, it was seen at Thomas's home in the TNT area. We went up to Thomas's home the same night and found a footprint this thing had made. Thursday, we went up to the plant with reporters and went through it. While we were inside, Steve shut the boiler door. When we were outside, we hear a loud noise. We went back inside and the door was open. What this thing looked like is about six feet tall with large wings on its back. It has the shape of a man. It has two red eyes about two inches in diameter, six to eight inches apart a wing spread of ten feet. This thing, whatever it is, is definitely not a crane or goose or balloon or any of the things that it has been called. I have seen it, and I know what it looks like. Linda Scarberry's Report We were riding through the TNT area on a side road by the old powerhouse building around 12 o'clock on Tuesday night, November 15th, 1966, when we came over this small rise in the road. All at once, Steve yelled for us to look at that thing in the road. I looked up and saw it around the corner of the old powerhouse. It didn't run, but wobbled like it couldn't keep its balance. Its wings were spread just a little. 
We sat there for a few seconds. Then Roger took off. I kept yelling for him to hurry. We didn't even stop for the curves. We got out on Route 62 and was coming down the road and that thing was sitting on the second hill when you come into the first bad curves. As soon as our lights hit it, it was gone. It spread its wings a little and went straight up into the air. We got to the armory and it was flying over the car. We were going between 100 and 105 miles per hour down that straight stretch and that thing was just gliding back and forth over the back end of the car. As we got there in front of the lights by the resort, it dived at our car and went away. I could hear the wings flapping as if to get more speed as it went up. We were all terrified and kept yelling for Roger to go faster. As we came into that straight stretch by C.C. Lewis's farm, the thing was over the car again. Then it disappeared as we came into the lights by C.C. Lewis's gates. We went on downtown and stopped at Dairyland and tried to decide what to do. We just sat there and looked at each other. I wanted to go to the police, but Steve and Roger kept saying they'd just laugh at us. We talked about it a while and Roger and Steve wanted to go back up the road. Mary and I kept trying to talk them out of it. And finally, when we go to C.C. Lewis's gate, they decided they didn't want to go back up, so we turned around. As we were turning, we saw a big dead dog laying in the road. When we were almost turned around, this thing jumped and leaped over our car and went through the field on the other side of the road. We decided to go to the police then and went down around Tiny's drive-in looking for them. Gary was outside the drive-in getting ready to take a couple of boys home so we told him about seeing this thing and asked him to call the police. After the police came, we went back up the road in our car with Gary and the police about half a mile behind us. I saw it then in a pasture field with its wings out a little, walking towards the car. Then it went up in the air and came at the car. As Gary's car lights came over the rise in the road and its light shined on it, it disappeared. We went up and down the road looking for it, but didn't see any more. We went back down to the drive-in and got in Gary's car and went back up. We finally found Millard Halstead and we got with him and went to the powerhouse building. We were sat there with our lights out for about 15 or 20 minutes when I heard that squeaking sound like a mouse only a lot stronger. A shadow went across the building over on the hill across from us. Mary and I saw the red eyes and then told Millard. He shined the lights right on them without being told where they were. We saw dust coming from the ground or somewhere as Millard moved the spotlight around. We finally left and came to the trailer. The Mallets were afraid to go to their apartments, so we decided to stay together. But we didn't go to bed. We just turned on all the lights and stayed up. Wednesday, we went up again to the building and found these off-tracks around the building. Steve was around the boilers by himself. And suddenly, he came running out white as a sheet, yelling for someone. He said he saw it in the boiler. That night, it was seen at Thomas's. So we went up there and Mary and I stayed in the house while Steve and Roger and a few others, bystanders, went looking for it. On the way up, I saw it from the highway above the trees gliding back and forth. They searched the area around Thomas's house, but didn't find anything. We started home around 12.30, and I saw it in one of the maintenance buildings. Mary and I started crying, and Roger took off. I kept thinking about that thing following us again, but it didn't. We went to my mother's, and I went all to pieces. Roger and my dad took me down to the hospital. I finally got back home, and we all stayed together that night again, but didn't go to bed until three or four o'clock. We were still afraid to go to sleep. The next day, Thursday, we went back up with reporters and we all heard a clanging noise from inside the building. 
Roger and Steve and the reporters went back in and found the boiler door open that Steve had shut when he left a few minutes before that. That night, we went back up, and Mary Hare and I saw the eyes inside the fenced-off place beside the powerhouse building. On the way home, I saw its eyes back in some trees from the road as the car went past, and looked back and could see its form. That is the last time I have seen it. To me, it just looks like a man with wings. It was a dirty grey colour. It has a body-shaped form with wings on its back that come around it. It has muscular legs like a man, and fiery red eyes that glow when the lights hit it. There was no glowing about it until the lights hit it. I couldn't see its head or arms. I don't know if the eyes are even in a head. When we came down the straight stretch by the armory, it didn't even seem like it had any trouble keeping up with us. It must have had very powerful wings. At no time did this thing fly at us from the front of the car. It stayed over the back end of the car while it was chasing us. It seemed to be afraid of lights, but I read in the paper today that it has been seen in the daytime in town. I don't understand. The prints we found at C.C. Lewis's gate and at both powerhouses and Thomas's, they look like two horseshoes put together but they're smooth. I know people are laughing at us, but it's no laughing matter. We'll never forget this thing. It has affected our lives in many ways. I am keeping going on nerve and sleeping pills. When it's dark, I feel the fear creeping over me. When I go any place, I automatically look up and out the windows. I'm afraid to sleep at night, so I lay awake sometimes crying with fear. When I do sleep or go to bed, the lights burn all night. Even in the daylight, I'm afraid to be by myself. I walk around in my own house expecting to see that thing. I close my eyes day or night and I can see those red fiery eyes staring at me. Every little noise scares me to death. I can stand in a crowd and hear people talking about us and laughing. People have said that we were probably liquored up but we were not. They go up there expecting to see it, but then they say they don't believe us. We have seen it, so we know what to look for, and we are constantly looking. Not because we want to see it, but because we're afraid we'll see it again. Out of all the phone calls we've gotten, not one minister has called to help us or try to explain what it is. We all agree we talk to a minister about it, but no one takes us that serious. One minister even laughed and said they'd finally run the devil out of their church and that's what we saw. We've been harassed and laughed at and called crazy. We just can't go up there and hand it to people on a silver platter like they seem to want us to do. We are never really going to get over our fear until we find out for sure what this thing is. I know I'll never forget it. I don't think anyone can who has seen it. Mary Mallet's Report the four of us were riding around between 11.30 and 12 o'clock Tuesday, November 15th, 1966, when we came in from behind the old powerhouse. And as soon as we came up in seeing distance of the powerhouse, Steve first saw this thing along the side of the road, and it ran to the powerhouse. That is when I first saw this thing, which appeared to be a man about six feet tall with wings on its back and red eyes two inches in diameter and about six inches apart. The Scarberries also saw this thing at the corner of the powerhouse, and we all seemed to be stunned, and he took off out the road at fast speed, and as we drove back toward the town on Route 62, we saw this man with wings standing on a bank, but I could not see its head, and as soon as our lights hit the bank you could see its eyes plainly, and it seemed to take off upward very fast. Well, we all saw that and Roger, the driver, speeded down the road, and as we speeded down the road on the straight stretch at a speed of 100 or 105 miles per hour, the thing glided over the top of our car, back and forth, until we drove into the lights by the armory. The thing never once flew in front of our car. It seemed to be afraid of the lights. We drove down through town and stopped in the lights at about Dairyland to talk and we discussed it, 
and Linda said, I think we should go to the police. But we didn't. Then we decided to go back. We got as far as C.C. Lewis's gate because we were not really for going back. As Roger turned the car around, the lights moved over a large dead dog along the side of the road. As we turned, something ran from behind a tree and jumped over the top of the back of our car and ran through the field. This was when we decided we should tell someone. We went down by Tiny's drive-in and Gary and a couple of others were just coming out of the door, so we told him what we had seen. We were all frightened, and the first thing he asked us was, Have you kids been drinking? And our answer was, No, we had not been drinking. So we asked Gary to call the police, and he did. We waited on the police, and when they arrived, we decided that the four of us would go up the road ahead of everyone. So we all did. As we were driving up the road, we saw it again in a field, and it came up behind us. And when Gary's lights could be seen behind us, the thing left again, and we turned at the traffic circle and went back. Millard Halstead searched the treetops with his searchlights, and we all went back to Tiny's, and the four of us got in the car with Gary and went back. And in the dark area, on the left side of the road, I saw two large red eyes, and all I could do was point and burst into tears as fright came into me. But none of the other four saw anything. So we turned at the traffic circle again and went back into town. And Gary told Millard of our frightening experience. And we got into the car with Millard and went back to the powerhouse and sat there with the doors locked and our lights off. We could all see shadows coming over the building. And I said I could see those eyes. And Millard put the spotlight right on them without asking any direction in which we were looking. Millard turned the lights on and we all saw something looking like dust or smoke. We saw that twice, then we came back and got Roger's car, and we all went to the trailer. We decided to stay with them that night. We were all so frightened we locked the doors and turned on all the lights and stayed up all night. We went back to the old powerhouse the next day. The men took their guns and went through the old powerhouse. Roger was on top of the building, and Steve was inside looking around, and Roger came down to the outside when we heard Steve yell, Come back here! Roger came down before anyone else went into the place, and he said he opened one of the boiler doors and saw something move upward. We all were looking around the place and found some funny prints like a double hoof print of a horse. Then we all returned home. We stayed together most of the time. About 9.30 that evening, we heard that it was seen at Thomas's, so we went directly up there, and the men took their guns that night. We saw tracks up there, and we went home about 12.30, and we all stayed together that night. The next day was Thursday, and we went back with the TV reporters, and all the men looked in the building, and came back to talk with us when they heard a clang in the building, and went back to investigate the noise, and one of the doors of the boilers had been opened. That evening, we all went back. The reporters from the messenger went up. While they were all looking at the building, Linda saw the eyes in a field, and Mrs. Hare also saw the eyes. On the way home, right before we got to the Point Pleasant Resort, I saw it better than I had ever seen it before. I could see the complete outline of it and the eyes, but I could not see any head. That time was the most frightening time I ever saw this. When you see something like this, you know you will never forget it. At night, you wonder where this man-like creature is, and if it will harm you, and it is all I seem to think about. When we go somewhere, I can feel someone laughing at me, and I can be in a crowd and hear people say, well, they were all liquored up, and God only knows we were not. But all I have heard and seen is news reporters and telephones. I do think I would feel better if a minister would come and talk to us and try to help us get over this fear. There has not been a minister to call us out of all of our phone calls or even try to get in touch with us. Thank you for watching and or listening to this video. If you enjoyed it, please go ahead and hit the like button and if you don't already, 
go ahead and subscribe to my channel and select the notification bell so you don't miss out on any future uploads. Also, please leave a comment on this video letting me know what you thought of it. Comments really help with the YouTube algorithm and will really help my channel to grow. If you have a story you would like me to narrate, please email me at mrsinisterstories at gmail.com. I have recently passed 50,000 subscribers to this channel and I'm halfway to my next major milestone. Thank you to everyone who is continuing to subscribe to this channel and contributing to its growth by liking videos and leaving comments. Once I get to 100,000 subscribers, my plan is to reward you all with an epic video with over three hours of original content. If that is the sort of thing you want to hear, please keep helping this channel to grow. If you want to support me even further, there are a number of ways you can do so. You can consider leaving me a tip for this video via my PayPal. Link is included in the description. Check out my Teespring store and consider purchasing one of my shirt designs. Or, on Audible, there is a book, Punch by J.R. Park, that I narrated. I do get a small royalty if you decide to purchase that. Thanks again for watching.